I've had a bunch of requests to issue some videos also in English. So in this clip, I'm going to explain why I'm worried about the idea coming from Gotagama that all 225 MPs in Parliament must somehow go. I don't agree with that view, and I know I'm going to get some flack for what I'm going to say here. But don't get me wrong. I'm also one of the millions of Sri Lankans who supports and endorses and admires the Go to Go movement. Gotabe Rajapaksa has failed miserably, and if he has an ounce of self-respect left, he must go. But I don't understand what people mean when they say all 225 must go. Then what? Who governs the country? If all 225 go, it is certain that a dictator will step in and fill that void. Remember what happened in Egypt. Is that what you want for Sri Lanka? I've also seen some demands that the nationalists must go and be replaced by intellectuals and scholars. This is obviously impossible to do. I doubt if a single nationalist MP will resign. Instead, the proposal made by the Bar Association of Sri Lanka might be more practical. That is to repeal the 20th Amendment and bring back the 19th, but with more democratic safeguards. But regardless of how much pressure the people's protest applies on them, I doubt whether the Pohutu MPs will agree to amend the constitution. For one thing, it will mean throwing poor Basil out of parliament because of his dual citizenship. Throwing their own national organizer under the bus might be just too much loss of face for the party to bear. And besides that, he is after all the president's baby brother. But just like you and me, the BASL doesn't trust the judgment and integrity of the 15-member interim cabinet they propose. So they've also proposed a 15-member advisory council to guide the cabinet. These are supposed to be qualified professionals or people with expertise relevant to the economy. I worry about this too. I've had the good fortune to work in government for almost half my career. So I've seen how government works, both from the inside and the outside. In my experience, very few professionals from civil society understand the process of government well enough to be able to advise effectively. You don't need me to remind you that it was just this that Vyat Maga specifically set out to do. But that was a total failure, an absolute disaster. First off, the best professionals are already embedded in successful careers. Even after they retire, there is demand for their paid service, I should say highly paid service, whether as advisors, consultants or corporate board members. They won't easily leave those jobs for temporary and thankless government jobs. It's mainly the losers, the cranks and the loonies who are at a loose end waiting for a government job, usually to make a fast buck. That's why we have such poor candidates being appointed as chairman of government authorities, enterprises and boards and corporations. Most of them are unemployable elsewhere. They're just cronies who hang around politicians. How else can freeloaders who didn't even pass their A-levels become the chairman of multi-billion rupee enterprises? But even if such a professional is highly qualified, it is no guarantee of success. Take, for example, W.D. Lakshman professor of economics, with a doctorate from Oxford, no less. Prior to being appointed as governor of the Central Bank in 2019, he was head of the Department of Economics of the University of Colombo. Well, you don't need me to remind you that it was the trillions of rupees that he printed that led to the spiralling inflation we see today. Then we have Dr. Kenneth De Silva, PhD, the chairman of Lanka Clear, the national payment network operated by the central bank. When international credit rating agencies were issuing dire warnings about Sri Lanka's economic future last year, here's what he told the Daily Mirror. The banking sector, he said, is well positioned to handle any liquidity risk in any macroeconomic headwinds that may come about as a result of such downgrades. And here he goes again. Firstly, Money printing does not lead to inflation. Seriously? And that myth has been proven globally. No, Dr. De Silva, exactly the converse has been proven globally. He then claimed that this is an exciting period for Sri Lanka's central banking. I am confident that the monetary policy adopted by the Central Bank of Sri Lanka would not be inflationary. 
seriously? Well, dear viewers, what do you think of Dr. De Silva's judgment? You probably don't have a PhD in economics like he does, but looking at the prices of food, medicine, and fuel, do you agree with him that the monetary policy adopted by the central bank hasn't been inflationary? For goodness sake, where do they find these people from? And he still keeps his job at the central bank. It's incredible. And so it was that our economy collapsed, even as it was in the hands of these highly qualified professional economists. And don't forget to add Dr. P.B. Jayasundara to that list. If you want to remind yourself of his fitness for public office, just look up the Supreme Court records from 2008. Now let's move on to the agricultural debacle. The government has yet to release the rice production statistics for last year, and I think we all know why that is. According to informal estimates, the ban on agrochemicals last May resulted in a 50% drop in rice production. It was primarily the Government Medical Officers Association that lobbied for this ban, without any foundation of scientific evidence. In a YouTube video last year, I dissected a speech made by their president, Dr. Andrew de Pardenia, a consultant pediatric neurologist, showing him to be talking absolute nonsense, utter rubbish. I didn't publish an English version of that video, despite many requests that I do, because it would be an embarrassment to the whole of Sri Lanka, especially to our excellent medical professionals. But as far as I know, the GMOA has still not reversed its position. And now, in a twist of supreme hypocrisy, the GMOA is protesting against the economic collapse, even though it was its own president who was primarily responsible for pushing the government into this disaster. And Dr. Pardenia wasn't alone. He was aided and abetted by other professionals like Dr. Priyanta Yapa, Professor of Ecological Agriculture at Sabaragamo University, who has a PhD from the University of Reading. It was this distinguished professional, by the way, who, despite advice from Sri Lanka's Medical Association and the World Health Organization, prevailed on the government not to allow the burial of COVID victims. Sri Lanka became the only country in the world to do that, thereby angering the Muslim nations and jeopardizing the chances of Sri Lankans to work in the Middle East. And then there's Professor Channa Jayasumana, PhD, FRCP, the Minister of Health. He's been responsible for his own share of faff about agrochemicals. He also made world news when he approved a herbal medication for the treatment of COVID-19 in government hospitals. Now, that's a professional talking. The point of my video here is not to belittle people like these, though God knows they deserve to be belittled. The point I'm trying to make is that we need to be careful when putting our faith in professionals and intellectuals and scholars. Pragmatism and common sense are much more important when it comes to formulating government policy. It is simply too easy for people with fringe ideologies like money printing doesn't cause inflation or agrochemicals, even if correctly used, are bad for your health, to ruin economies, to ruin countries as we have seen in Sri Lanka. In March this year, barely a month before the Treasury declared bankruptcy, the President appointed an 11-member National Economic Council. Amazingly, six of the 11 didn't have so much as a university degree. None of them had a PhD in anything, let alone economics. Among their first decisions was that what they needed was a 16-member advisory council, that is to advise the economic council. And even this advisory council was dominated by businessmen, successful businessmen, I'll grant them that, like Dhammika Pereira, Krishan Balendra, Ashraf Oma, Hans Vijayasuriya, Ranjit Page, Vishgovinda Swami, Prabash Subhasinghe, Ashok Patirage, and Mohan Panditage. I know many of these guys. They're all nice chaps. Kanabono Minisu. But at least the ones I know are absolutely clueless about the national economy. If you ask them what our debt-to-GDP ratio is, or roughly what our higher education or health or defense budgets are, all they can do is whip out their fancy iPhones and rush to Google. In appointing such people to advise on the economy, the president made an error often made by ignorant people, that when you're rich, you really know what you're on about. And it won't make one bit of difference if I answer right or wrong. 
When you're rich, they think you really know. Many rich people think they got rich because of their unique skills and their hard work. Uh huh. They got rich because of just plain luck. The right parents, the right school, accidentally meeting the right person, and yes, the right genes. If you know how to buy something for 10 rupees and sell it for 12, you very soon become rich. But that doesn't make you an expert in national economics. I have in my time met my fair share of loony doctors and even loony scientists, but I've yet to meet a loony lawyer. Well, maybe with the exception of one former chief justice. So I have the highest respect for the BASL and fully endorse their proposals, the proposals they've made to get Sri Lanka out of this mess. But please, BASL, put some mechanism in place to keep out people who see flying saucers behind every tree out of government. Or the fate of those brave youngsters protesting in sunshine and in rain on Goldface is going to be very bleak indeed.